So this is episode 23 of Treatment Room Secrets podcast. Um, so super exciting. And I have a, um, a special guest who I was able to meet for the first time a few months ago coming across his book, Sit Better. That's, that's the name of the book, correct? Exactly. So I'm here with Dr. Turner Osler. Um, I am sitting here in Burlington, Vermont. And I will honestly jump on any opportunity to visit Burlington because I think it's so, I think we used the word adorable yesterday, but it is, it's so adorable, especially coming from, you know, visiting more aggressive cities in the US, um, like Miami, like New York, uh, like coming, I flew in from Philadelphia. Um, it's really, it's refreshing almost, you know, adorable and refreshing maybe is, is the two words that I'll choose to, uh, t uh, to use to, as being here to describe what it feels like for me being here. Um, but super happy to have you on. Um, so thank you for being here. No, it's exciting to be here. Um, and I know we've had uh, multiple discussions about uh, different topics. Um, I came across your book, which led me to your chair, um, which led me to your TED talk as well, the TEDx talk, um, which was super eye-opening for me. Um, eye-opening for me because I never really paid attention to the way I was sitting. Um, no, and no one does because we just accept chairs as part of the built environment. You've always been around chairs. You can't imagine life without chairs. But it's because we have such short memories. For most of human history, we didn't have chairs. For three million years, we were hunter-gatherers, and nobody could be bothered to drag furniture around because, um, you know, they were hunting and gathering. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm conscious that this might be the uh, episode where I'm mostly focused on my uh, on my sitting. Um, I hope it will be. Um, but you know, I think there's um, even I remember the first before even reaching out to you. Um, I I before speaking with you for the first time, I read bits of your book, and I think the I think it's the first or maybe second part or chapter of the book is um, like small hacks that you can make just to f almost fix or help the way we are used to sitting on a what we know as normal chairs or normal stools. Um, so I, I said that I never really thought about the way I was sitting. That's that's false because I did think about, about the way I was sitting. I would always think about keeping my back straight. But besides thinking about keeping my back straight, which is pretty difficult to do um, while sitting for prolonged periods of time, I never really thought about my hips. I never really thought about the placement of my sit bones um, or the placement of my feet when it comes to sitting. Even now, I call myself like crossing my legs and bringing my feet underneath the chair, uh, which completely changed the position of my pelvis. Um, ever since I came across your chairs, um, I've been an advocate of at least the concept of active sitting. Um, and I think I mentioned this to you. I'm sitting here also wearing my uh, barefoot shoes. I, but I can't see under the table right now, but are you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so I find, so, so I find that very interesting. Um, I am compelled um, to like products that are selling something that's difficult for the consumer to, to do and to implement in their lives. Well, and it's been made systematically difficult. Um, when we were um, handed running shoes with, padding on the heels, it changed the way everybody ran. Suddenly they ran with a uh, heel strike. This is not how the human animal is designed to run. We're designed to run barefoot with a flat foot that's feeling the environment as you run. When uh, you know, running shoes came along, it, it changed the way people run. And it also in, um, introduced a whole new set of injuries that runners could have. So by changing the way people use their bodies, we introduce whole new problems. Um, shoes, for example, change the way we walk. And it turns out that the ergonomic chairs that we've been uh, told by the ergonomic community, and wouldn't they know? That's their job. Um, um, you know, turn out to change the way we, our posture while we're sitting and change it in a way that's rather destructive. So what is the story of chairs? How did we go from being too busy to sit to sit? To only sitting. Sitting wrong. Yeah, only sitting and sitting wrong. Right. So for most of human history, no chairs. And it's interesting. You would think that the hunter-gatherers would like, you know, sit down on the ground, but that's not what they do. 
hunter-gatherers squat. And it's an unthinkable thing for most of us to think of squatting for, you know, having lunch or watching an episode on Netflix because most of us have lost the ability to squat. And maybe lost the ability isn't the way to think about it. We, you might even say the ability to squat has been stolen from us because when we slide chairs under the bottoms of little kids, we, we change the body mechanics to the point that um, by the time they're really in the second or third grade, they've lost the ability to squat. And by the time you're an adult, it's almost impossible to get it back. But squatting is the birthright of human beings. It's a, it's a, um, a very important position because it lets you be in an active rest position um, without you know, putting your bottom down with the termites and scorpions and snakes. Um, it's a, it's a, so it's a posture that you find throughout the hunter-gatherer communities that still exist in the world, the Hadza and the Kling and, the, and other populations you find in Africa and, and um, Indonesian places like that. Um, so when did we move from squatting to sitting? And it turns out that we know this with considerable accuracy. We, we know that, you know, chairs came along and you can find pictures of chairs and, you know, and, uh, you know Greek friezes from, uh, you know, uh, you know, hundreds BC and even back into Egyptian times, you can find um, artwork depicting people on sitting on chairs of some sort or other. But these were all kings and queens and gods. The common people were squatting. And it kind of remained that way until um, about the mid-1600s when we switched from squatting to sitting in Europe. And we know this because squatting produces a, a particular uh, facet in the uh, talus bone of the ankle, because when you squat, the talus pushes up against the tibia. And so by looking at the skeletal remains from Europe over you know 2,000 years, we you know, anthropologists can determine that pretty much we went from squatting to sitting around the 1600s. That's when um, benches came along and tree stumps. And, and so, so sitting became the preferred posture over squatting. And then, uh, as time moved on, um, chairs were manufactured and so became ubiquitous. And then our work environment changed. You know, we went from, you know, standing on assembly lines to sitting in cubicles doing knowledge work. And now people are sitting for, on average, eight to ten hours a day. This was never part of the design envelope for human beings. We were you know, designed for hunting and gathering, for walking uh, several miles a day. And by taking our, our hunter-gatherer selves and planting our bottoms on a chair and sitting inertly for eight or ten hours a day, we've caused a lot of mischief. Do we know, um, based on the individuals who were sitting in the 1600s, 1700s, leading up till today, um, like what I'm trying to think about is, did they immediately collapse into the chair, or was it a was it a like a trained method of trying to sit correctly? No, but they they sat. I'm sure much better. We don't, you know, we don't have journals documenting this kind of thing. But our terrible chairs really came along when we invented the backrest and the armrest and the footrest and the headrest and and the coup de grace lumbar support, you know, as chairs became more elaborate trying to support us, they, they actually don't support us. They um, uh, confine and distort our posture. As soon as you have something to lean against, now you're leaning. You're not balanced with your internal um, ergonomics, you know, your, your skeleton. Your skeleton is designed to support you in gravity. It's perfect. As soon as you start leaning against something, uh, that uh, immense advantage is lost. Additionally, um, our biochemistry over millions of years of evolution came to expect that we would be physically active. And in order uh, for our enzymatic systems and our milieu interior, the way, the way our, our biochemistry works, we, our bodies need exercise. And when you slump and your muscles go dark, um, your biochemistry changes. When I say your muscles go dark, um, they, they stop 
um, having electrophysiologic activity. And it turns out muscles aren't just um, mechanical units that move your bones. They're biochemical factories that are spinning off lots of cofactors and affect the, uh, your entire metabolism. So every physician knows that if you could just write a prescription for exercise, all of your patients would be healthier. It's hard to get patients to fill that prescription. So what exactly happens to the body when you're sitting? Um, because a lot of the, you're mentioning muscles and a lot of people's minds might go immediately to, you know, the, 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 the visible muscles that we're used to seeing all the time. But I'm assuming when sitting correctly or when you're sitting in or just sitting badly, um, you are not activating a lot of these stabilizing muscles in the core and in the, in, around the spine. Right. No, um, when we say muscles, people think of the, the visible, obvious muscles, you know, the bicep and the lats. The bro, the bro muscles. The bro muscles. But really, these muscles are you know, kind of add-ons. You know, what you really need is um, postural control in order to walk. Um, and if you, if you look at hunter-gatherers, nobody would say they're jacked. They would say they have good definition. And they certainly function well, but but just making a muscle bigger doesn't make it um, more useful. The fine control of muscles is extremely important, and it turns out your spine has just got hundreds of little muscles that are constantly adjusting your posture. When you lean against the, the back of a chair, all of those muscles stop functioning. They just go dark, and now... Um, with your, now you're sitting in an odd posture that you're really not designed for. And the human spine is an immensely brilliant design, and it can put up with a lot of abuse. But eight or 10 hours a day for decades is really outside its design envelope. And so it's not surprising that 80% uh, of Americans, and really everybody in the developed world, develops back pain severe enough to require visiting a healthcare professional sometime in their life. 80%. Well, 80% failure rate is uh, shocking for something that's as perfect as the spine. And the root cause is that we're really not using our spines in a way that they're designed to. And if you, you know, if you, if you leave your car in first gear, you can expect the engine to blow out way sooner. Similarly, if you abuse yourself by, um, uh, you know, letting your muscles go dark and slump for eight or 10 hours a day, as the muscle mass for your core musculature and your spine musculature um, uh, evaporates, uh, you know, it, it, uh, atrophy is the technical term. You know, trophic means giving something stimulation so it continues to be healthy. Atrophic is when you stop stimulating something and it wastes away. And your body is, your body is extremely careful with its resources. If you're not using a muscle, your body says, well. Uh, no point in parking protein there. I'll move the protein to some other muscle that we are using. So by sitting slumped, all of your core musculature that adjusts your posture moment to moment um, weakens to the point where you can't sit without support. And then it's a downward spiral. So pretty much everyone is in pain. You know, everyone I know, I'm assuming most people that you know, have some sort of pains, whether it's, you know, upper back, mid back, lower back, sciatica, um, knee pain, whatever it is, but we're, everyone's in pain all the time. Um, and do you believe that a lot of it is coming from sitting? I do. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, um, when you talk to hunter-gatherer populations, they're not whining about pain. Um, you know, they're a little concerned about whether they're going to catch the next giraffe or, you know, whether their yam-digging stick is sharp enough. But, you know, pain isn't really part of their portfolio. Um, because they're using their bodies every day in a way that it's designed for. And when you think about it, you, you, you know, our bodies are, are designed to be sort of self-sharpening. You know, by the way, if you're using your body, you're keeping it um, uh, well-tuned and well-honed. Um, but if you stop using your body, it, wait, well, Hippocrates perhaps said it best when he said, that which is used develops and that which is not used wastes away. Um, you know, and, and he didn't think in terms of the bustle, the 
body parking protein in this muscle or that muscle. But but that's what that's what it is. You know, if you use something, it develops, and if you stop using it, it wastes away. And you need your postural muscles in order to have posture that doesn't damage your facet joints and your intervertebral discs. So what are people buying when they spend thousands of dollars on, you know, the best the best ergonomic chairs uh, for their offices, right? Because there, there's a scale here when you, you know, you, you if you walk into an office building, you'll see people sitting on like crappy chairs, cheap chairs, um, and you'll see people sitting on super expensive padded chairs. Um, so what are they spending their money on? Um, do you think they're not helping themselves at all because you know in a way um because i've i've sat on a couple of these uh really really nice comfortable um office chairs um and it does it feels like you're sitting into a perfectly supportive cloud yeah so there it's interesting there are a couple of things going on one is galen kranz wrote a terrific book um entitled the chair and i, I she's a sociologist and she you know, she, but you know, she also understands physiology and anatomy. She's one of the first to the to to talk about these problems back in the '90s, actually. And she, you know, views chairs uh, from a sociologic perspective. You know, the more important you are, the bigger the chair you get. You know, the you know, the chairman of the board was the guy who got the chair, while everybody else had to sit on a bench. You know, it's 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 so. Part of it is just sociology, making people more important. And I wasn't aware of this until I was a, uh, a professor at the, in the Department of Surgery at the University of New Mexico, and um, they built a new building for, for the hospital, and they moved the surgery department into it. And everybody got a new office with a chair in it. And the chairs were, you know, arrayed by whether you were an assistant professor, a full professor, an associate professor, because you know it was it was just a marker for just how important you were, and you know, the chairs were all crappy, but they were of different size and color and had a different price tag. You know, it's a it's a marker for your arrivedness or something. So so that's part of what you get when you pay more money for a chair is you you can buy prestige. You know, I I can afford a ten thousand dollar chair. Can you kind of? But but more shockingly, all of these chairs are basically the same. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I've been to ergonomic conferences and trade shows about office chairs, and they are the design really hasn't changed in 30 years. You know, they all have backrests, headrests, armrests, and, and lumbar support. It's all the same. The, and the chair companies, of course, wish to differentiate so that they can charge more for some chair than others, so they make it bigger or heavier or more leather or more chrome or whatever. But it's, they're all the same design. And the design is shockingly bad, um, and I I know this because I I I was at a I was at the Ergo Expo. It's a it's a ergonomics conference uh, in um, Las Vegas, New Mexico, several years ago. Us uh, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, um, several years ago, and um, I met a guy um, who is famous in the world of chair design. You know, he's like got stubble and an ascot and groupies i mean he's he's like important and and he he was part of the herman miller Aeron chair design team in the late 1990s they sold millions millions of these chairs his whole life is chair design and and office furniture so i was there and i showed him one of our um, uh, chairs that's you know, just has an unstable seat that you know, kind of requires that people engage their core in order to stay seated. And, you know, he was puzzled by it because he'd never seen anything like that. And we had a very far-ranging discussion, a very smart guy. He knows everything and everybody in the world of ergonomic chair design. And um, and, and I'm just like, a, you know, an actress, you know, on a emeritus professor from the University of Vermont's surgery department, but I know about anatomy and physiology and, and kinesiology and anthropology. And, and so we had a very interesting discussion and, you know, we swapped email addresses and, and I didn't think much more about it until I got a email from him 
a week later, and he said, I feel terrible. I've spent my whole life trying to design chairs so comfortable no one would want to get up, and now you're telling me that's a catastrophe for their health and their posture and back pain. But what do you want me to do? We've convinced everybody they can't sit without lumbar support, and now I cannot sell a chair unless it has lumbar support. So th yeah, these guys are trapped by their legacy. They've sold a product. You can't sit without a backrest. And now they're trapped. And we swapped a lot of email. I sent him one of our chairs. He sent me a video of his kids playing on our chairs. And so it's... He's, these, this group is struggling to find a way forward because the solution they hit on, more support, turns out to be not just a dead end, but a bad idea. Are people experiencing nowadays, at least uh, based on studies done, more back pain pains than before, more pelvic pains than before? Right. It's hard to measure in a population because you need a random sample and, 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 and then measuring pain is a nightmare, right? It's a Likert scale. And, and do you mean all day or at a particular time? And so, so measuring pain is hard. But we do know that, you know, the, the, the number I come back to is 80% of uh, people in the developed world, the United States and other uh, countries, uh, develop back pain that sends them to a healthcare professional sometime in their life. That can't be right. You know, there is something terribly wrong. And, you know, I think it's how we're living our lives. Um, you know, hunter-gatherers don't have these problems. I'm thinking about laying down. Um, does that have less of a negative effect on the body? No, I, I think that laying down is kind of in our design envelope. You know, uh, you know humans need to sleep. Um which this is a sidebar, but we don't exactly know why people need to sleep, but it's not just people. All animals need to sleep. Whales need to sleep. How do you sleep when you're swimming, right? Well, it, it turns out they have this cool thing where half of the brain can sleep and the other half of the brain is awake and keeping an eye out for sharks and stuff. It's uh, it, so, 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 and sleep um, you know, puts people at incredible risk for being eaten by a carnivore. Um, so if sleep isn't absolutely essential, it's the worst idea evolution ever had. So, so, uh, so, so sleep is built into our design envelope, and we're designed to sleep basically anywhere. Um, people ask me, you know, what, what kind of bed should I be sleeping on? Sure, it really matters. Um, you know, I... I sleep on Japanese tatami mats. I think I think that's terrific. But you know, every everybody no, because I mean, because also like laying, you don't have maybe that um, you don't have that force that or weight that's crushing you down and making you collapse into yourself. Right. Your 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 body is designed to relax into the ground, lying on your back or your side or your stomach. People have all these different postures that they adopt, but they're uniformly supported in a way that the body is expecting. The business of a backrest and a headrest and armrest, lumbar support, this is not what the body is expecting. So I want to talk about um, you and your training and your past um, because, you know, it's a very interesting one because you're not a, you're not coming here from the economic world or the economic community, right? No, I, I should have begun with a disclaimer. I have no formal <laughs> economic training. And I used to be embarrassed by that, but I think now that um, it's an immense advantage. Maybe people would have stopped listening if we said that in the beginning, so it's maybe good you didn't. So now we can um, throw in the disclaimers. I've managed to find a know-nothing. <laughs> no, but, but, you know, by not, um, well, it's, it's, and it's the same in medicine, you know. Um, well, is it, do you mind giving like a, a background to, to, to your, yeah, so what's your background in medicine? Sure, happy to do so, but in medicine, in, in, in medical school, they told us, you know, half of what we're teaching you is wrong. We just don't know which half, you know. So, so when you when you get uh, into a a clique, you 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 inherit their prejudices, and then you can't see them because they're just built in. 
Um, and so coming to this problem from outside the world of ergonomics and chair design and, and that, I think has been an advantage for me. I, you know, I, I started out um, uh, at, as an undergraduate at Princeton studying anthropology and eventually neurobiology. And then I went to medical school and then I did a surgical residency and then I did a trauma fellowship and an ICU fellowship and I did a burn fellowship and I spent, you know, 30 years doing um, academic trauma surgery. But also um, research along the way. I, I, I published over 300 peer-reviewed papers because, you know, I, that um, I'm interested in a lot of, um, I'm interested in doing medicine better and discovering what works and what doesn't and where we've made mistakes in the past. And so, um, and then I, um, I, I transitioned out of the operating room and started doing epidemiology full time. And that's when I started having back pain of my own because I wasn't up and around, you know, running from the clinic to the OR to the ICU and, uh, you know, back to the ER. I, uh, and so, you know, I, I got interested in the problems that come with sitting and sitting a lot because I was writing computer code. And so, um, you know, I, I came to the, the problem with a, with a toolkit of anatomy and physiology from my time in medical world and the operating room. And also epidemiology, because I studied that as, as part of my um, research career. And they, they, they nicely dovetailed in looking at the problem of sitting, because it's a problem with um, physiologic roots, but an epidemiologic uh, problem structure. And so, you know, I, it, it seems as though I'd been getting ready for this problem my whole career. Not on purpose, obviously, but um, I just happened to have the toolkit. And I wasn't contaminated. It's maybe too strong a word by by the by the ergonomic um, uh, dictum. You know, their 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 central dogma that you have to sit with your ankles at ninety degrees, your knees at ninety degrees, and your hips at ninety degrees, and a backrest and lumbar support, or you know, you're doomed. Really, um, all that stuff is new. Right, I, I mean, hunter gatherers for ninety nine percent of human history didn't have any of that stuff, and seem to be doing better. Thank you. If I put dev, the devil's advocate uh, cap on for a second, um, you know, the comparing us to hunter gatherers and that they were doing better. Many people will say that maybe not. That maybe they weren't living as long. Maybe they weren't as productive. Uh, oh, good point. You know, and and um, when people try and compute how long a hunter-gatherer lived works out to be 32 years. And the gotcha crowd says, see, you know, yeah. if you're over 32 years old, you owe it all to your office chair. This is, this is, no, 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 no. You understand, you misunderstand what an average is, right? The average lifespan of a hunter-gatherer was 32 years, yes. But that's because half of the kids died young because, you know, infant mortality is a, is a big problem when you're a hunter-gatherer. If you made it past the age of 10, you were good to be 60 or 70. So it's a possibly even willful misunderstanding of the data. Yes, hunter-gatherers live to an average age of 32, but that's just, okay, we know that there's high infant mortality. That's a different problem. Um, um, but hunter-gatherers in general, I think we're, um, well, and we know this because we can go look at hunter-gatherer populations now. We can measure their cholesterol and their, you know, look at their coronary arteries. They don't have the problems of modernity. They don't have our disease structure. Um, uh, they don't have colon cancer because they're eating high-fiber diets um, and so on. Yeah. So you leave the, um, the surgery room. And you, you're starting to feel some more back pains yourself, some more physical pains? Yes. Um, you know, and I thought, well, you know, how hard can this be? Um, so I started looking into it. And it turned out that back pain is a problem that we really, uh, it, it's, it's really surprising. We, we do not understand what causes back pain. Um, and that's a shocking admission because 80% of people have back pain. And we have to ask the question, why is Western medicine so uninterested? And I, I think the answer is that nobody dies of back pain. And 
And there are short-term solutions that are stretched, and it, and, painkillers. Well, and, and people almost always get better automatically. You know, if you give people pain medicine or you don't, they'll be better in a week and pretty much out of the out of the problem zone within a month, no matter what treatment you give. And and that so it's it's shocking that Western medicine doesn't have more to offer. You can feel a little better because uh, all the alternative medicine uh, solutions have about the same success rate. Um, nothing seems to work very well, um, but everybody seems to get better. I say nobody dies of back pain. But that's not precisely true because um, it turns out that well-meaning physicians will see somebody with back pain and sometimes uh, offer them narcotics, which can open the door to addiction, which can result in death. So while back pain hasn't, doesn't have a, uh, a propensity for mortality, treating back pain can. And you occasionally run into people with such back, bad, bad back pain that, you know, they, they, you know, it so distorts their lives that um, uh, suicide is uh, kind of their, their final pathway. It's not common, but, but, the, but narcotics for back pain is a common catastrophe. Yeah. So you're experiencing more pain yourself. Um, and so how, how, how do you, just by s searching for solutions for yourself? Oh, so the first thing you do is you, you go to you know, scholar.google.com and then you, you wander around the National Library of Medicine and you read every paper that's ever been written. <laughs> I don't think, yeah, I don't think that's the first thing that most people would do. No, no, but yeah, it, that's a, <laughs> but yeah. If, if you have a research, a medical research background, that's, that's, that's the obvious go-to thing. And, and you discover that nobody understands what's causing back pain. And as a physician, you know that if you, if you don't understand the pathophysiology of a disease, if you don't understand what's causing the disease, you know, you, you, your treatment will be basically magical, right? Because if you don't understand what's causing the disease and you say, do this, right? That's, that, you're, that, that's, just, that's just magic. So... You know, it's shocking that we don't understand the pathophysiology. Um, and so, meanwhile, uh, here's a guy with back pain, me, and, you know, millions of other people. And so I just bought every you know, chair that was supposed to, you know, I did the kneeling chair and the, 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 the Balin's kneeling chair, the, 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 the yoga ball. I tried, uh, none of that stuff worked. And also, the research showed none of that stuff worked. But what is I'll hold you on this for a second. What does what does medicine say in the in the research papers about where back pain stems from? They say they don't know. Um, terrific, uh, a whole a whole issue of um, uh, the Lancet, one of the foremost medical publications in the world, uh, in uh, 2018, voted to back pain and came to the conclusion we don't know what causes it. We know that it's the leading cause of disability in the world, but we don't know what causes it. Shocking. Shocking. So you you bought all these different um, oh, yeah. chairs on the spectrum of uh, of ergonomic chairs. Yeah, and none of them none of them made any sense, um, and and or or worked. And then you know I was introduced to the concept of active sitting. You know, sitting on a chair that's slightly unstable, so that you have to keep yourself balanced or you fall off. But isn't that the, what the yoga ball is trying to emulate? Well, the yoga ball, it seems like it would be there, but there are problems with the yoga ball. Uh, one is that in order to organize your posture, you have to be able to feel your ischial tuberosity. You have to be able to feel your sitting bones because that's, um, your, your posture is designed for standing and walking. And it turns out that your ischial tuberosities, if you look at the human pelvis, are just directly plumb line below where the femurs plug into the acetabulum. So you can think of your ischial tuberosities, your sitting bones, as the kickstand for the human pelvis. You know, when you, when you swing the, fem the femurs out of the way, you land right on your, on your sitting bones. And by being able to feel, and your sitting bones, uh, they're, they're, they're not, not points, they're a, uh, a surface that's maybe two and a half centimeters by one centimeter that you can move around on and feel your position. And by being able to feel your sitting bones and, and, your, and the position of your pelvis in space, you give um, neurologic input to your whole balancing mechanism. Um, and 
your whole postural muscles kick in. This happens at the reflex level. Your brain doesn't consciously create your posture. Um, it can listen in and see, oh, that's what my posture is now. But so I think that's the, what I was trying to say in the beginning. That's the difference in my mind that happened maybe since uh, speaking to you for the first time or being introduced to your book is I was trying to use my brain to straighten myself while sitting, to sit comfortably. But your brain immediately becomes distracted. Anybody who's spent um, more than 20 seconds trying to meditate knows that their brain immediately goes to someplace else. So the idea that you're going to concentrate on your posture, it, you know, I, I, it's a failed concept, and usually it fails in 20 seconds. So you're not going to be able to adjust your posture with your conscious brain because that's not what your brain is for. You know, your posture has to be self-regulating so that your posture is appropriate when the, the, you know, you're chasing a rabbit or a jackal is chasing you. It has to be on autopilot. And so your whole um, postural mechanism is, um, it's a little like breathing in the sense that, you know, breathing is so important, it happens automatically. But you can hold your breath or, or, or change your rate of breathing consciously. But as soon as you stop paying attention, you're, you go back to autopilot. Same with your posture. You can do whatever you want with your posture, but as soon as you stop paying attention, it slips back into autopilot. It can be distorted, however, because as it's trying to get to autopilot, if you're being pushed on by a backrest or an armrest or a headrest or something, you, you can't get to autopilot. You just you, you fall into some, um, uh, some uh, approximation that just doesn't work very well. So... Um, what you what we want is we want people to be able to have their spines interact spontaneously with gravity, um, and y y you probably know this, but kids um, uh, don't start out walking very well. It takes them a year or more to to be able to walk. Why is that? You know, are they lazy? Are they just not uh, what? And the answer is. It's, Standing up in gravity is an extremely complicated proposition. There's a lot of joints that have to be adjusted to keep you balanced in gravity. And so children, they're growing synapses at you know, tens of thousands a second in their burgeoning brains, um, are constantly reprogramming themselves to exist in gravity. And they go from creeping to crawling to toddling to finally upright posture and finally um, coherent walking. Um, uh, it takes time because they're programming their central nervous system to exist in gravity. And basically, they all succeed. So you're very good at balancing your posture in gravity. But as soon as somebody puts supports against you, you know, you kind of lose that mojo. And if they do it long enough, you, you lose the strength to implement what your nervous system has so uh, painstakingly learned. Um, so, you know, we, it is our birthright to have good posture naturally, but, um, it's taken away from us by the promise of comfort. When the listeners, um, hear maybe your voice, um, start moving far away from the microphone, just so they know it's you demanding, uh, <laughs> the, what well, maybe seems like normal postures nowadays for people when sitting, collapsing into your, to your backrest, um, so the yoga ball is not going to do it because you don't feel is that because so, you don't feel your you sit bones. Feel your sitting bones. So that's the first problem is now you, you people just can't get organized. And if you watch people in a yoga ball they sit and then pretty much they slump immediately because their pelvis rolls back. A second problem with the yoga ball is that um in order to have coherent posture you need to have your knees lower than your hips. And so how high your bottom should be above the floor is kind of dependent on how long your legs are. And a yoga ball basically comes in one size. So it's very hard to get a, to get a yoga ball that fits you because they, they don't fit hard. Yeah, and you tried, and you tried that route. And, and even if you found a yoga ball that fit you today, it depends on the barometric pressure and the temperature and the leak rate of the yoga ball because they're you know, constantly. So, so those are all problems. And finally, I, I uh, was talking to um, the head of HR at the University of Michigan uh, at some ergonomic conference or other, 
And she said they had banned the yoga ball from all of their office spaces at the University of Michigan because they had five catastrophic failures. Because you know, yoga balls, the, the the big appeal of yoga balls is they're inexpensive. You know, they're they're but the problem is they're made out of plastic that is flexible because it has plasticizer in it. The plasticizer evaporates over time, and the and the plastic becomes brittle. And when the plastic becomes brittle, uh, eventually it'll crack. And when it does, the yoga ball will suddenly deflate. And uh, people and me and no matter what your martial art background, you will land pretty hard if your chair suddenly disappears. And um, and they had you know people with back injuries and a head injury that required burr holes to drain the blood out of the brain. Um, so they, you know, so yoga, and she said, you know, if, if you allow yoga balls in your institution, you must uh, throw them all away on January the 1st every year and buy all new because a yoga ball that's less than a year old is much less likely to fail catastrophically. So, you know, th there are a lot of things not to like about the yoga ball. You know, not only does it not work, but actually it's sort of dangerous and it looks silly. <laughs> I mean, it seems like it would be fun, but you know, I I, I tried to sit on one, and I, it just doesn't work. Definitely looks a bit silly. Um, so, so you sort of trying out all these different options to try and see what, if anything, helps you. If anything, it's any, anything there that you can maintain uh, for a long time. Was there anything that was helpful? You just thought to yourself that there's no way I can keep doing this forever. So, um, so. Uh, I, I, I study a kind of uh, body movement um, technology called Feldenkrais, invented by Moshe Feldenkrais back in the mid-1900s. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a way of thinking about um, improving your um, neurologic habits um, through uh, slow exploration of different movement patterns. And... Um, what so exploring your neuro habits, neurological habits. Your neurologic habits, how you use your body. You, you always open a doorknob this habitually. You never pay any attention. Is that the best way for you to open a doorknob? And even if it was the best way for you to open a doorknob when you were 20, is it still the best way to open a doorknob when you're 70? So you, you pay attention to these small motions that you use a lot. So can you um, can you describe what, if I, sh if I went today to a Feldenkrais um, session in a studio that practices these, um, this, these techniques, what would a session look like? Well, there are two kinds of sessions. Um, there are group lessons where um, you come in and um, typically, often, it's just lie down on the floor. And then uh, it'll be something like... Um, Find a way to get your shoulder blades to relax into the floor. Now, find a way to get your um, uh, your pelvis to relax into the floor. Now, see if you can get your spine, vertebrae by vertebrae, to touch the floor with greater pressure top to bottom. You're just finding small motions to adjust your posture in ways that you probably don't think about. No reasonable person would ever think about. It. Yeah. But by exploring different ways to move, you find new ways to move. Yeah. But 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 if I was looking through the window, you would just see people, people lying, lying on, on the, the floor. floor, and some guy making suggestions, and they would be moving not even very much. Uh, it would be profoundly boring to watch. But the internal experience can be quite enlightening. It's 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 hard to explain. Yeah, and uh, this, but you said there's two kinds. That... And and then you can have a one-on-one -on -one session, um, a so-called a functional integration lesson, where a person who's studied Feldenkrais for perhaps decades will gently move you through um, um, uh, movement patterns that you might not have thought of on your own. Um, by taking your joints through movement range without your muscles being involved. You can explore the kinesiology of your joints in a way that you really can't do on your own. Hard to explain, but if we'll set you up with a session. All right. No, no, you, 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 you'll find it enlightening, I think. But uh, so I, I was, um, I was uh, having a session with a very advanced Feldenkrais teacher in Montreal, as it happens, not far from Burlington, and um, he uh, said, without showing me, he said, "Sit down on this," and I sat down on it. This is fascinating. 
he'd, he'd put me on a chair with an unstable surface. And I thought, boy, I got to have one of these. And it was made by a company in Germany, Mishu. Um, all the mechanisms made out of wood, very expensive, over a thousand bucks. Um, but it was just uh, so enlightening for me. And so I started showing it around to my friends in the movement community here in Burlington and, and uh, Aikido, uh, the martial arts community. And they said, oh, we want one of these. And I was too embarrassed to tell them I'd spent a thousand bucks on some weirdo chair. And so I said, I, it was kind of expensive, but I'm sure we could make one that would be just, just about as good. And it was a preposterous thing for me to say, an uh, utter hubris, because I'm a washed up trauma surgeon. I've never designed any furniture in my life and certainly nothing as weird as this. But, you know, I was lucky enough to fall in with a design community of uh, people in a maker space here in Burlington um, called uh, The Generator. And they had tools and, uh, and people who knew a lot about design and engineering and who were excited about this idea. So I had a cadre of very smart people working with me. And pretty soon we had workable designs that we could share with people. So the Mishu chair, was that the first introduction to you maybe feeling a bit like um, you can maintain your active sitting? What was possible? It required that I take charge of my posture while I was sitting. There's no alternative. So you that's have to take care. So of it requires it requires you to um, to it's, really. It's kind of tough love. It requires you to take charge of your posture. Yeah, non-negotiable. If, and nobody's ever fallen asleep on one of these things. <laughs> yeah. It's a good one for the, maybe going for the, to the movie theater, because nowadays I, I just cannot go to the movie theater without falling asleep. Right, no, and this is what happens when, when uh, comfort yeah. is, is, the, what is the design that they're going for. Really what we should be going for is trying to approximate walking. Um, and so if you put somebody on an unstable chair, the hips and pelvis and spine can move as though walking. And although it's, it's, it's I guess it's even better than walking in a cubicle because you don't have to decide where you're going to go. You're, you're, you get the, the neurologic um, stimulation and the muscular um, exercise of walking without having to go anywhere. So for people that are not active sitting and who don't have act active chairs or are not sitting on yoga balls, um, what can they fix now in the next 10 seconds um, that will help them? So, you know, we have a, we worked out a hack for the standard office chair. The first thing is to raise it higher than they tell you. You want to get your hips higher than your knees. So hip higher than knees is an important component. And so what that does is by having the hips um, higher than the knees, you drop the femurs beyond 90 degrees to 130 degrees. And when the femurs uh, drop lower, they pull on the psoas muscle, which is attached to the femur proximally and um, uh, L1, 2, 3, 4, 5 uh, uh, lumbar vertebrae. And so by dropping the femur, the psoas muscle pulls anteriorly on the five lumbar vertebrae and reasserts lumbar lordosis, the normal curve in the low back that you expect to see in people who are standing or walking, rather than hunched. Um, and um, uh, uh, NPR did a piece on this, and they, they call this uh, doggy down. You know, they think of it as a dog's tail being down, kind of a whipped dog, or, or puppy uppy, you know, where, where if you roll your pelvis uh, forward as though the dog's tail was coming up and back. Now your lumbar lordosis comes back and your posture becomes more normal. Yeah. So uh, the way I'm sitting now in the chair, I think we have the same chairs. It's impossible because you can't adjust the height of this chair. So you're locked in at 90, 90, 90. And my hips can't. are slightly lower than my knees. Right. And so now you're you're kind of in the doggy downer. It's like uh, it's pulling me into it. Right. But if you had a, a standard issue office chair with a gas cylinder, you can raise the seat your, your hips are now higher in space, higher than your knees. Your your hip angle opens to 120 or 130 degrees. Your psoas muscle pulls on L1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you get your lumbar lordosis back. That's already an immense help. To do this, you have to raise your chair up high and then slide forward to the 
you know, so your ischial tuberosity, your sitting bones are on the on the first four inches of the chair. So basically, you you're ignoring ninety nine percent of your office chair. You're just using two little spots on the front of the chair in order to to rest your ischial tuberosities, and you want to get it high enough so your knees are lower than your hips. How yeah. how high does it need to be, or can it get too high as well? You know, um, it's negotiable, and you may want to change it up during the day. But in general, um, you know, you want your your hip angle to open to 130 degrees, and how high that is depends on how long your femur is and how long your tibia is. And this, so so um, but but what what we want is an open hip hip angle. Um, and once you once you have an open hip angle and you're balanced on your ischial tuberosities and, and and now your normal posture, your your spine will will have a silent conversation with gravity. You'll get your lumbar lordosis, your shoulders will come back, your head will center up on uh, you know, C one, C two, um, as long as you're not like got your head down on a screen, um, and your posture will just naturally return to um, the posture you practiced as an infant. So, it, well, so if like us sitting now on not the standard gas cylinder office chair, um, what so what could I do? Still, to I want to ignore ninety nine percent of the chair of the seat itself. So you want to get as far forward on the chair as you can. I'll do it now as we as you guide as you guide me through it. So uh, you, so you want to get your ischial tuberosities to within the first uh, two or three inches of the f the front edge of your chair, yeah. and and now maybe you can drop your knees by bending your ankles uh, and sliding your feet under the chair. So now you have an open hip angle. Um, your knees are now lower than your hips, and you can feel your lumbar lordosis is coming back to you. So my so my ankles do not need to be right below the knees. It doesn't have to have that ninety degree angle. No, no, no. Oh, okay. uh, uh, it, it's fine if they do, but uh, the only way that can happen is if you can raise the seat pan of the chair, and we can't do that with the chairs we have here. So, so the way, but the the key is to get your knees lower than your hips. You can find a way to do it on basically any chair, and when you do that, you oh my chest comes up. Yeah, I had to raise my microphone. Uh, you, have to, you have to move your microphone. and But mostly your lumbar lordosis reasserts itself in a way that's normal. And I don't know about you, but uh, and my shoulders relax. Uh, you know, I, so it's for, for me, it's night and day. So here's an interesting one um, to throw into the mix. This is something I try and practice. Um, on days where I am having a great morning, I could spend the whole day active sitting, but on days where, you know, you have a, uh, not the best day, maybe something bad happens, you know, you, you're late for something, things are not going the way you planned them to be that day, you hear bad news, I completely forget about it, I just want to go back back to my old habits of... Sure, and no, and, and, and we tell people, you know, if you get an active chair, you know, keep your other chair in the room and switch back and forth when you're having a bad day and just want to, you know, collapse. Fine, or even better. <laughs> I uh, a um, Tai Chi instructor once said to me, um, "The back of your chair is there, so you have some place to hang your coat. <laughs> if you feel like you need to lean against it, you should go home and take a nap." And, and I kind of think that, you know, if you're so beaten down that you have to slump in your chair, really you're better off just lying down on the floor and taking a nap. This is what a hunter-gatherer would do. They would, they would say, oh, I'm tired. Time to lie down. It, it may be hard depending on how big a cubicle they give you, but, yeah, yeah, but lying down is the, is the better response than, than collapsing. Okay, so there's a mainstream human resistance or cultural resistance to everything we've discussed so far. It won't be easy. Why do you think that this, like even people that they don't have any skin in the game of the, you know, the financial economic companies, um, why are they so resistant to, to break out the dogma of just the normal office chair? Well, I, I think it's just as simple as it seems normal because they've been around office chairs for their whole lives. And it's difficult to imagine anything else. You, you've perhaps heard that sitting is the new smoking. And I'm old enough to remember when people smoked in airplanes, right? It was, everybody smoked. It was considered normal. 
And it took the public health community decades to roll that back. And now we know that, you know, smoking is a terrible idea. Um, it wasn't easy to claw it back um, because, uh, well, because there was, among other things, um, systematic disinformation. Um, I don't know, you may be aware of this story, but um, cigarette companies hired actors in white coats to impersonate physicians and talk about how smoking was good for them because it would help them lose weight. I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that story. Well, it still shocks me. Uh, you know, it still shocks me. Um, and, um, you know, just so with the, the big, uh, big chair, um, you know, they've, they've had this narrative that you, you have to buy their expensive you know, chrome and leather encrusted uh, contrivance or uh, you, 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 you won't, you aren't a success because you, you, know, you, needed a fa you need a fancy chair to, to be part of the establishment. And um, moreover, you can't be comfortable without it. So very similar. I think there's a uh, mainstream cultural resistance to what we mentioned earlier, the barefoot uh, community. Absolutely. Complete uh, cultural resistance because it's something that I'm almost shy to mention around, uh, you know, what we know as normal people. Uh, we have Devin and Will here sitting with us, um, both uh, not actively sitting, and sorry to call you guys out, and um, not wearing barefoot shoes, but that's that's the norm. Um is there anything else? It's only yeah. the norm, you know, in the last few hundred years. For 99.9% .9 of human history, you know, they would be barefoot. And their, and their feet would be better for it. So can you educate me? Is there anything else um, in your life that you've implemented that's maybe that you used, you used to follow the mainstream uh, cultural dogma that you've kind of uh, separated yourself from? When it comes to maybe physical objects like shoes, like chairs, right? No, I, I, you know, I accepted the shoes that we were given for you know much of my life. Um, you know, I, I wore you know running shoes in the OR, and you know they they get bloody, and we'd put them in the washing machine. You know, I, it's, it's they were just, um, you know, they were just the shoes that were available. It didn't occur to us, didn't occur to me that uh, there was an alternative. You know the the barefoot shoe revolution is um, well, uh, you know, it's 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 been hard for the barefoot shoe guys to um, uh, make headway, but I I, I know a couple of uh, I, I know the CEOs of a couple of barefoot shoe companies because there's a they they face really the same problem we do in the active sitting world only they're you know twenty years ahead of us um, and they've worked very hard to um, break through the resistance uh, to to uh, barefoot shoes. So, is there anything, any other um, like physical objects that you've uh, brought into your life that seems, uh, you know, uh, like you're going rogue? Um. Well, I was an early adopter of bicycles, <laughs> and it was considered, uh, you know, all my. High school chums were eager to get car keys, and I just stuck with my bicycle because I, it seemed like a, a better solution. Um, so um, I, I've been happy to be contrarian right along, but um, you know I, I sat in the chairs they gave me in school and in my office as a as a professor in the surgery department until you know I took things into my my own hands. Yeah, in um, in medical school, you said that they said to you guys that. Half of what they teach you is going to be wrong. They just don't know which half, uh, which is a fascinating thing to hear. Um, also one worth repeating a few times to think about. Did you find yourself searching always for to try and discover maybe what was wrong? Well, um, I, so, um, uh, you know, this, this story is disquieting, but, um, you know, breast cancer was a, you know, been a problem for the human race for a very long time. And when I was in surgical training, we would do mastectomies. We would remove the, if you found a breast cancer, biopsy, it's cancer, you remove the breast. And still patients would develop recurrence and die. And so if your only tool is a knife, um, we thought, well, you know, we just didn't do a, a big enough operation. So we started doing bigger operations. You know, first we took the 
breast, and then we okay, okay, that didn't work, so we'll take the breast and the p ma the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor. We have to start taking out more of the chest wall. Finally, we're taking out ribs, and breast cancer was still recurring because we didn't understand that breast cancer was a systemic disease from the moment you pick it up. It just that's just the way it is, and so bigger operations was not the solution. We were just you know, it, 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 it hurts me to this day to say we were, we were maiming people, um, not because we were, we had bad intentions, but because we didn't understand the process. We didn't understand the disease. And now we know lumpectomy, radiation, chemo, and you're good. So we just didn't understand the disease. And if you don't understand a disease, you can't treat it, um, uh, in the, in the most effective way. So, um, which is why, you know, bringing it back, it's, it's essential to understand any problem if you plan to solve it. And, and that's why back pain has been so intractable. You know, we, we don't have a good handle on it. But we do have um, some hints that hunter-gatherers don't have this problem. Active sitting seems to help with it. Oh, you know, I kind of think it's, the, it's a disease of modernity. It's the, the fact that we, we try and make our hunter-gatherer uh, anatomy conform to some artificial support system of an office chair. That's a problem. So you were a uh, trauma surgeon. Can you uh, try and give me an insight into your life then? Um, I'm imagining that you had to be someone super calm, um, under major stress, under major difficulties. Um, no, and, and more than that, you know, teach other people how to do that. Um, and, um, you know, when, when somebody's bleeding and dying, the room goes crazy. Um, uh, and, you know, the, we would tell medical students, wait, stop. You are not bleeding. He is bleeding. You can relax and you'll be much more effective if you can relax. So, you know, the first thing is to get control of your own system. And then you can be much more useful to other people. And it, it's a hard thing to teach. And, you know, s some people just aren't suited for it. And then for them, we have psychiatry or radiology. There are other medical specialties. You don't, you don't have to be a trauma surgeon, thank goodness. Uh, so the first thing is to be in control of yourself. How do, and how do you teach one to be in control of themselves? Or how do, how do you teach it through a medical school? Well, you know, um, my... My approach is aphorisms, you know. Um, you are not bleeding. If you can just understand that four-word sentence, it'll help you relax. Also, you know, if you're going crazy, you can't help anybody. How did you learn that yourself? Um, like, did you find yourself in a um, in the OR? Um, not reacting well, the I, way you I would say I would say you learn by trial and error you know I, I I vividly remember some kid that run over on his bicycle and had his liver ripped to shreds and was bleeding out on the, on the operating table and he just could not make it stop and um I started crying I'm the senior surgeon and the room just dissolved into chaos. So you have to have control of yourself in order to be useful and in order to control the room so you can hopefully uh, uh, come to a successful resolution. But you also have to understand that everybody dies. So you won't succeed every time. You can't. If it's not possible to hurt a person so badly that they uh, can't be salvaged, uh, that's not plausible. So, you know, you have to help medical students and residents get past the um, everybody dies. We do the best we can. And it's a, it's a difficult lesson. And, you know, as I say, it's... It's hard, and so that's why we have psychiatry and radiology and other specialties where, you know, they're protected from uh, the hurly-burly. 
Is that something you wanted to get to in your career? Is that something you aimed for? Uh, it's um, trauma surgery is uh, a terrific. Um, well, uh, Ambrose Paré said to learn surgery, you should go to war. You know, because there's just so much surgery that's required, and so many different kinds of surgery are required. And nothing is um, is by the book. You have to invent every operation anew. So it's a very interesting and challenging. Um, it's almost like jamming in music. You have to like be able to invent solutions to problems that perhaps have never been seen before. So it's a fascinating specialty built on tragedy. Um, and um, I've. Um, I was in the public health service and never in the military, so I haven't been to a, a war zone. Um, but um, the inner city of Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, it's kind of a war zone. We would get gunshot wounds and stab wounds basically every night. And so it's a fascinating specialty because the surgery is just so uh, challenging and so interesting. But with that comes the possibility that uh, some people will die on the operating table or die in the ICU. And, you know, the surgery was, was great, but the, the um, you know, finding a way to navigate the, the tragedy that's implicit in the, in the specialty is hard. But it's true for every, uh, for m many medical specialties. You know, oncologists lose patients because uh, cancer is a wily foe. Um, internal medicine, people die of heart disease or, or whatever. So it's, it's a part of the puzzle is to be able to deal with, um, I was going to say failure, but that's not quite the right word because everybody dies. So um, it's, it's especially hard in trauma because typically they're young people. It's, it's easier when old people die. Children dying is the worst. Um, so, um, but it's an important part of the specialty because, you know, you have the opportunity to try and help the family through the worst moment of their lives. So, um, but they don't teach you this in medical school. Um, you, it's kind of, you learn by watching your mentors struggle and everyone struggles. Um, Trauma is a is a interesting specialty. I've I've lost several partners along the way to PTSD. Just because you don't have a gunshot wound doesn't mean it's not traumatic to see people with gunshot wounds or car wrecks or whatever. So, um, you know, it's a it's a uh, it's not for everybody. And by so, you know, I I want to ask. Um about the type of people that you see that enter this profession and this specialty. Um, but first, so but was it something you always wanted to do? Because again, you, it is very tra traumatic to be in your position, but it, you almost know to some extent what you're going into. You know it's not, maybe not, you might, might not know the uh, the uh, all the intricacies of it, but you know that you're stepping into something pretty uh, tragic. Well, I was attracted to the surgery because the surgery is fascinating. And then it turns out there's all this other stuff that comes with it. It's, as, I, as I tell medical students and residents who think they might be interested in a trauma career, I say, it's fun, but it's high-priced fun. Um, takes a toll. It, it takes a toll, and, it, and, it, and it's a 24-7 kind of job. So, um, you know, it's, it's not for everybody, but, um, you know, you need people in the hospital waiting in case in case your car is the one in the accident. And do you see um, a certain type of individual who ends up wanting to take this direction in medical school? There, there are a couple types. Uh, one is the the adrenaline junkies who just love uh, being in the middle of a catastrophe. Um, I was not one of those. I, I, I uh, as people were dying, I just wanted to throw up. It's not. It's it's not something I would seek out. I, the, the adrenaline high is just not what motivates me. But there are people who who um, who have that motivation. They don't do as well. Um, you do better if you 
are methodical and trying to help out rather than um, enjoying the excitement. You, you, should, uh, you know, it's, it's better if you're there for the technical challenge rather than the excitement. And now, um, is that something that you miss? No, I, you know, uh, when I said I was going to uh, drop out of the operating room schedule, um, my partners, a couple of my partners said to me, uh, yes, yeah, you'll be, you'll be climbing the walls. You'll be begging to come. No, 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 no. There's a lot of other things you can do. I immediately started doing epidemiology and haven't looked back. You know, it was, it was exciting, but, um, you know, they're very, you can actually make a bigger contribution as an epidemiologist. Um, in an operating room, you know, you get to operate on maybe five, possibly 10,000 patients in your life. That's it. You can't physically operate on more people than that. But as an epidemiologist, you can save millions of lives if you can figure out how to cure malaria or uh, arrange for uh, cars not to crash or, or uh, arrange for guns not to be available. You know, if you can make these kinds of, of uh, changes in the built environment, you can save millions of lives. By becoming a senior a senior surgeon, by default, are you an educator, teacher as well, because you have people around you all the time learning from you? Right. Um, so I, I've always been part of a university program. We've always had residents, and and it's a you know the residents uh, are the deal is that uh, you know they'll work very hard to learn the craft, and our obligation is to uh, teach them the craft. And it's it's a very uh, surgery is a very interesting thing to teach because um, um, it's 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 a sort of uh, well intentioned violence. Um, you know, if you take a knife and cut somebody open, under any circumstance other than an operating room, they put you in jail. Right. So it's a it's a it's a violent um, uh, occupation, and things can go wrong. And so by putting yourself in a position where you've operated on a person, it's, it's rather intimidating because if things go wrong, it was you. So our job is to take residents and get them past that to where they can successfully do operations before they realize how scary it was. Because it is scary. So you you wrote your book, Sid Better. You wrote over you said three hundred um, articles, published articles, right in the in the, the journals, medical literature, medical literature. Um, have you ever written about your experiences as a surgeon? <laughs> no. Uh, so I was um, I was a uh, uh, officer in the public health service uh, in the Alaska Native Medical Service um, in it. Uh, Alaska from uh, 71 to 73, no, no, 81, 79 to 82, but, but, but back in the last year. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I, I was in the Pribilof Islands, which are a thousand miles west by northwest of Anchorage, way, way out in the Bering Sea. You, you, it takes uh, six hours to get there on a prop plane, three hours on a Learjet. And I was like, the only medical guy on this island with several thousand uh, Inupiates and uh, a Coast Guard station and, and some tourists in the summertime. And um, so, you know, it was a it was an interesting practice because I was delivering babies and amputating limbs and pulling teeth and treating heart failure. And, you know, it was, it was just like the, the whole, you know, I was shooting my own x-rays, doing my own lab work. It was, it was, it was, it was exciting. Um, but but the the paperwork was was just punishing, and so I I just stopped sending filling out the forms and sending them to Anchorage, and instead I would like write a journal about things that had happened, and and once a month I'd send off a report to to Anchorage, and I I, I finally titled it the Pribilof Journal, and and uh, so I, I just wrote about my experiences as kind of an outback bush doctor, and. Uh, I, I ran across a copy of that uh, just a few weeks ago when my, my now 27-year-old son was asking about it. It's, it's pretty exciting reading. I'd forgotten I'd done that stuff. 
So um, it's, it's not published. It's just reports that I sent back to Anchorage. Fascinating. Um, so it was still uh, preserved. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's legible. It's, well, it's you know, it's a, a typed carbon copy. So, you know, it's from from that era. Phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so back to um, before we, I want to actually you know, talk about the specific chair. Um, but martial arts, you know, we threw in the Feldenkrais. Um, I know it's not martial art, uh, but Feldenkrais. You mentioned Tai Chi and you mentioned Aikido so far in the. Uh, in the podcast, um, is there anything else you practice? When did you start maybe introducing yourself to martial arts? Uh, so I, I, I started by doing uh, Taekwondo when I was uh, in my early teens. And in college, um, I was part of the um, all-Irish uh, delegation to the All-European Judo Championships of uh, 1971. Seventy-one. Um, so I was doing competition judo, um, and then um, I got distracted by decades of surgery, um, and I, I, um, I didn't get back to um, my martial arts until I had a, a six-year-old, and uh, I wanted to teach him how to do a judo roll, and he kept doing somersaults. So I thought, you know, surely there's somebody who can teach this kid uh, this stuff. So I wound up at a, a Aikido dojo here in um, Burlington, and. And so I wound up in the kids' class, and uh, and after a few years, the head instructor said, "You know, you really should train with grown-ups." And so it's, it's all it's all been downhill since then. I think it's, it's a lot easier to face off with a seven-year-old than a than a twenty-seven-year-old. I'll just tell you that. But but it's uh, but um, the business of Aikido has been very helpful to me in the study of posture because um, martial arts is all about having being able to have good balance yourself and unbalancing your opponent. And so, you know, by studying balance in yourself, you um, you can help other people find better balance for themselves. So how would you suggest for people to explore this, you know, personal inner balance? It's very, you know, I even me, it's something I only recently I started thinking about and paying attention to. For me, I think it became just by starting to practice yoga, um, going to all these sessions consistently, being challenged by new postures, being challenged by correcting my uh, the postures that I thought I was doing well, but or I keep getting corrected every time I think that I got it or nailed it. I always keep getting corrected, um, which is very frustrating, but very um, eye opening as well. Um, and I think you know when you when you try and work on your you know your inner balance by performing a plank let's say, the way I planked for 99% of my life versus the way I plank now is completely different. From the outside, it looks maybe exactly the same. But for what I feel and what how I move my internal muscles, position of my my bones, my structures, is completely different. So, so how, I, I, I still haven't developed a way where I can sit down with my brother and uh, have him understand what the hell I'm talking about, so I shut up. Um, it's uh, these things are um, oddly like surgery. You know, they're they're infinitely perfectible. Um, you know, I at the end of every operation, I turn to the the residents and I would say, now if we were going to do that all over again, what would we do differently? Always there was something we could do better. Maybe not much better, but some better. And and similarly for yoga postures or Aikido throws or um, the Tai Chi postures, uh, all of it is infinitely perfectible. And as you look more and more closely, you discover more and more um, possibilities. Um, and pretty much, I think you need a teacher to help you with this. Um, even if that teacher keeps telling you the same thing over and over again, you are not the same person that heard that same instruction yesterday or last week or last month. Um, was it Heraclitus who said, um, uh, a man never crosses, you can never cross the same river twice because it is not the same river and you are not the same man. So merely by practicing that posture, the way you practice that posture will change. To find this, it's very useful to have a teacher, whether it's 
Aikido or Feldenkrais or yoga or Tai Chi. Um, if you wanted to do, to explore the idea without a teacher, I would say play with a child like a child. You know, if you don't have one, borrow one. Yeah. You know, so about not, not just play with a child, but play with a child like a child. Like a child. And this will allow you to explore. Um, this is how children learn, is by, you know, these, uh, by discovering their toes and, and trying new things. And grown-ups kind of always open the door the same way at the same time every morning. It, it would be better to break out of that, and a child or, baby, or a puppy can help you. One more thing I want to explore with you is, and just for time purposes, because again, I said that off air that I could pick your brain for a very, very long time. Um, there's a specific, no, there is a specific mainstream way that we're taught to live um, in this culture that we're in right now, um, the Western culture, American culture, which, and again, comfortable shoes, you know, the Nike running shoes fall into that category, the ergonomic in quote unquote office chairs fall into that category as well and many 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 more things um is it fair to assume that 50 percent of it is um bad for us we just um don't know which 50 percent or we just don't know what's bad for us until you know people like yourself maybe try and bring it to the attention of the culture no i uh I and I so one more thing I just remembered you know you've been throwing out quotes um I saw a not trying to sound too smart here but a uh, Plato uh, quote that I saw on um on Instagram a few a few days ago um but it said that you know the the visionary that sees outside of the culture will never get the attention of the mainstream <laughs> Yeah no it's uh, if uh, it's uh, it's it's absolutely true you know um it's so in our little uh, project of trying to bring active sitting to the world, it's hard because it's a new concept. And, um, you know, the, the people I know with business degrees say, you never want to find yourself creating the market. Uh, it's too heavy a lift because, you know, people already think they know what a chair is. And so how do you break into that? Well, it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, People um, have the idea that comfort is something to be sought after. And so we have electric blankets. Okay. Um, you know, uh, but, you know, there, there are, there's always um, people who are exploring. So my, my son is now cold plunging. You know, I had you know, 32 degree water for five or 10 minutes every day. Um, it's an acquired taste, but he absolutely finds it revelatory. You know, probably not for everybody, but, um, you know, it's it's great that people are exploring those edges. And um, there's a lot of reason to believe cold plunging, you know, jumping into cold water has uh, uh, real physiologic uh, benefits. You know, dry, I don't want to go on a long soliloquy about brown fat and, and uh, how babies uh, can't shiver. But but uh, just, just to say, uh, challenging your physiology uh, really expands the, the possibilities of what you can do. I personally believe in the concept of active sitting. It's very new for me. Um, I'm here to say that even since we have started the podcast, even since we had you uh, kind of point out better ways to sit, even in the situation we're in right now, I've, my posture has been going back and forth, you know, better, worse. Uh, you can watch that and you can tweak it. So that's what I've been trying to do. Um, it's a, I think it's going to be a long journey for me to, you know, even be able to sit in front of my computer for a long work day um, using one of these um, active chairs. Um, but I'm a big believer, and I believe that it's it's helping me with, you know, I'm a, I'm a fairly young guy, but I've, I've I've always had back problems, back issues, um, and it's nice to go through stretches of my life, months with not having any back pains uh, because the one thing we did not mention about a back pain is um, when your back hurts, your back hurts and your body seizes up and, you know, and then you're really walking. Um, no, there, there's, a, there's a proverb in Marathi that says, when your back is not right, 
nothing is right. You know, you can't eat, you can't think, you can't sleep. It intrudes in your mental space every moment. You know, it's not just that people are missing work, although that's what the uh, you know, uh, economists measure, but it's that really every moment of life is degraded. So there's a, there's, there's a lot. It's, it's, it's crucial that we solve this problem. So please tell people where they uh, can find information about you, where they can find information they, about um, Core 360 and these uh, special chairs that you're creating. So we have a little startup project that we call QOR 360, Core 360. We have a website, coreqor360.com. Um, uh, I, I, I write a blog that's on our website. Um, we have another project that we call Button Shares, B U T T O N Chairs.org, where we give away a design for um, active chairs that can be made out of plywood very inexpensively, aiming for the uh, kid market. There are, the plans have been downloaded over 4,000 4, times now. So I have a feeling we're having a bigger impact in schools than we are in workplaces. But, you know, we're, we're, we're eager to help anybody who's interested find a more comfortable way to uh, survive our current built environment. You know, our lives require that we sit. We can't go back to hunter-gathering. It's just not practical for 7 billion people to try and hunt and gather. But what we can do is we can change our built environment in a way that lets us um, survive um, and, we hope, thrive. So by getting people to move while they're sitting, active sitting, um, we can claw back our birthright, which is to be moving constantly. Sit better, people. Dr. Turner Osler, thank you very much for being here. Pleasure seeing you again in Burlington, Vermont, and I can't wait until the next time. Your webinar will be uh, live on the website um, sometime soon, um, and super excited to... Um, grow this relationship with you oh well th thanks for having me i uh, yeah. and and my wife thanks you know by getting this out of my system we can talk about something else at dinner tonight <laughs> um well yeah it really is a pleasure so thank you for being here sure anytime if you liked this video and you want to see more make sure to subscribe below and don't forget to hit the notification button